Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. In a moment, we will go to our study. You will see that we will not have a bulletin, but we'll go directly to our teaching, and then we'll conclude the teaching with a few words of encouragement to you who are viewing our services online. Please take the opportunity of letting us know that you're watching, and if you desire to give an offering, you can do so online. If you're watching us via computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under Four Ways to Give to process your gift. You can also mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710. And remember, you can still come in and use the kiosks we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts, or you can place your gift in an envelope and hand it to one of our receptionists in the foyer. Thank you. And with that, let's get into the teaching. Let's open our Bibles to Song of Solomon. We're going to conclude our series in Song of Solomon by looking at the last uh, few verses. I'll introduce it by looking at verse 7 and uh, kind of going go over some of the things you've already looked at and then move on in. As you're opening your Bibles uh, to Song of Solomon chapter 8, this uh, upcoming Wednesday, we continue our series in the Gospel of John. I invite you to be with us as we look at chapter 8, verses 30 through 36. That'll take place this upcoming Wednesday night as we look at the truth that sets you free. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ promised to do. He said His truth would set you free. And so we'll look at that and see if we can find something practical as we look at that particular portion of Scripture. But here we have verse 7. I'm going to start at verse 7, though we're going to actually cover verses 8 through 14. But here in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, I'll begin at verse 7 by reading and uh, commenting and reviewing and then moving into verses 8 and concluding at verse 14. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. So as I was beginning to conclude this particular study, I was thinking about where we get our ideas, where we get our definition, if you will, our ideas of love. What is love? What is romantic love? What is married love? Where do we get those ideas from? And obviously, our first lessons concerning what married love is would come from our parents. Those of us who had a mom and a dad raising us in the family, remaining together, had a model that we basically bring into our marriages because they are what is really mentoring us in terms of what we would expect out of our own marital relationships. And so as we watch love being lived out in the home, as we watch a father, how he, how he is with his wife, as we watch a wife, how she is with her husband, we children cannot help but, but receive that like through osmosis, if you will. It just, it just permeates us as we see this, and, and it becomes what we expect love to be when we get married. And so if we see an open, committed love in the home, it's going to help us to be able to show the same thing when we get married. But also you have what is, what is called common culture. Common culture sets a tone for us. It actually educates our expectations. Uh, The things that we hear about love from others help to form our ideas concerning what love is. And so we have our friends, we have their families, and and, uh, we have the societal expectations and the variety of things we learn in our education. We have songs that are, are written concerning love that perhaps may speak to our hearts as we're growing older and all, and it helps to form within us what we think love is, and it also helps to establish what would be to us romance or a sense of what romance actually is. Growing up in the 50s, as I did, you know, there were a lot of songs. It's always, love is always sold well. And so there were always songs on the radio that that I would hear. My mom was only 19 when she gave birth to me. She was 17 or so, 18, just barely 18 when she gave birth to my brother. She already had two kids by the time she was 19. And 
So growing up in the 50s, my mama would always play music in the, off the, on the radio, and so I grew up listening to songs. I mean, you can't help it. I was born in 1950, so the 50s, a lot of songs. I can still remember songs like, uh, like uh, by the Paris Sisters. None of you will remember them. Uh, Paris Sisters, they're all dead now. But they sang um, uh, songs about love, and, and, and I heard them when they sang, I love how you love me. And, and it has set within me a romantic tone and this sense like, uh, one of these days, I, I do hope that there's some woman out there who will, will say that she loves me like these girls are singing here. And so I was raised with that. You know, in the 60s, so many different songs, you know, that, that really set your expectations, you know, like uh, Sonny and Cher you know, singing, you know, I've got you, babe. And and that, that classic, deep, powerful love song, Wild Thing, and other things like that. I mean, you, you grow up and, you know, you hear these songs, Soul and Inspiration, and so many different ones, Unchained Melody, that, that have these messages that you hear that, that uh, speak to your heart and really do set within you a sense of what is it going to be like one day when I meet that one who's going to be when I marry, you know, and, and it continues on over time. You can, you can hear songs that speak to you. Uh, there was a song uh, made years ago where part of the song says, I'm so proud to have you by my side. You be my strength and I'll be your guide. You are the one, you're a dream that is real. Heaven has sent you, it's love that I feel. And there are various songs that over the years have spoken to my heart and and uh, have kind of set a tone, or it's like deep calling unto deep. There was something within me that responded to the lyrics and, and caused me to have certain expectations and certain desires. And so songs can help you to uh, establish expectations as it relates to love. And that's what the Song of Solomon is intended to do, is to awaken in us uh, an awareness of what God's love is all about and how God's love can be lived out in a marital relationship. And so we've been looking at that as we've gone through Song of Solomon. A question that we could ask ourselves as we're about to look at this passage is what do we expect from love? And a second would be what keeps romance going in your relationship? I've already mentioned that we ought not to idealize love and believe that, that it's going to keep difficulties away from our life. Some people think their salvation will come when they have the right partner. But when things get tough, they bail out because they begin looking for someone who is better. And so as I've been sharing, when it comes to relationships, relational love, when it comes to marital love, we should expect challenges. And, and don't be surprised at the pain that you experience. There are disappointments. There are always going to be struggles. There will be times of anger. There are challenges. There will be times of loss and pain. We go through various kinds of struggles like finances or the loss of a, a job. We go through the physical pains that, that begin to beset us as we grow older. Those are all part of what takes place as you simply age and as you continue your relationship. You do have stresses. There's no doubt about that. Stress is part of being married. Uh, marriage engenders concern. And so expect the stresses. Deal with them. But you can deal with those things in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is a verse that I've taken to my heart and, and I try to remember on my daily basis. So you make up your mind that nothing will cause you to stop loving that person God has given to you. You see, Solomon in verse 7 had said, if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. You, you can't buy love. You couldn't purchase that loyalty. It's not something that you can go to the store and get. It's something that is given freely. It's something that is actually response to your overtures. And so we need to remember that. And we need to also be aware that no affair, no flirtatious relationship would ever be worth losing your marriage over. Those who have succumbed to those kinds of temptations realize that as they enter in, that it may be thrilling at the beginning, but ultimately you experience nothing new. And then you lose everything that meant anything. You lose your entire family, you break everybody's heart. If you have children, you break theirs. It's not worth it, never has been. And so as we've been looking at this, and my final installment is found here in verses 8 through 14, I've been wanting to share with you about building and enduring love, and that's what we'll look at as we conclude 
our study in the Song of Solomon. So beginning at verse 8 and reading verse 9, interesting, we have these, uh, by the way, these words are coming from the mouth of this uh, Shulamite, uh, the wife of Solomon. It's coming from the mouth of the Shulamite's brothers. They're speaking concerning their sister. In verse 8, we have a little sister. She has no breast. What shall we do for our sister in the day that she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. It's interesting how it begins, verse 8. We have a little sister, and she has no breast. You know, today there are, there are things that can be done to fix that problem. Um, what are you talking about? Why would you say that about your sister? They're speaking about their little sister who grew up and matured before their eyes. These are older brothers, it would seem. Brothers speaking of their little sister. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing uh, these brothers reminding everyone that they did their brotherly duty, if you will. They protected their little sister. They protected her purity. They're basically saying, we love her, and we've done all that we can to protect her from those who would harm her. And that's what brothers do. That's what brothers should do. They should protect their sisters from those who would harm them. Not all sisters like that. I know I have some sisters in the Lord here who had brothers who you probably thought were overprotective. I was overprotective to my sisters. At least they thought. They thought that for a while until they became women. And then they realized that a brother's duty is to care for a sister. And that's what you do. You love them and you, you care for them. And uh, these are brothers who are basically simply saying that. So one of the things that went into her marital relationship is she had people in her life who encouraged her to do the right thing. That is a very important thing that you might want to note for your own life. Surround yourself with people who encourage you to do what is right. There are plenty of people out there in the world who will encourage you to do what is wrong. You go to people for advice concerning a relationship. You're a young woman, you speak to your girlfriends, and you say to them, this guy's pressuring me, what should I do? And you have girlfriends who say, what's the big deal? If you want to keep them, come on, grow up. How old are you anyway? Don't surround yourself with friends who encourage you to lose your purity. Don't, in, don't, don't surround yourself with people who don't value fidelity and relationship, who don't see sexual chastity as something that's important. Don't go to people who give you bad counsel. It is so unwise. Surround yourself with people who love you enough to tell you the truth. So by way of application, these brothers are saying, we did our brotherly duty. We protected our sister. We cared about her purity, and we helped her to maintain it. It's very important to have that in your life. You may have a friend who's making a decision to be with somebody, and you know, know this, this guy, we'll say, is somebody who moves from girl to girl, uh, uses them for his own pleasure, and then drops them and goes to somebody else. And you may know that. You may work with them or know them on a friendship relationship, and, and you like the girl, and you know the guy, and you know what he's after. Love that girl enough to tell her, Love her enough to tell her, watch out. This guy's not after your love. This guy is after sex with you. Love him enough to tell him the truth. Don't hold back from them. Surround yourself with people who will encourage you to do the right thing. Sometimes they won't listen to you. Oh, they'll say, oh, you don't know him, or that was his past and all. And it can be reversed today. You don't know her. That's just what people have said, but she's changed. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. But keep your, be, be, be aware, just keep your guard up. You see, these brothers protected her. And so one, she had somebody around her that would protect her. But two, she made a decision that she would take care of herself. Notice verse 10. I am a wall and my breast like towers. 
I became in, in his eyes as one who found peace. She's basically saying, I protected my own purity. I made sure that I was not taken advantage of. What is it that motivated her or equipped her to do that? Well, her values and her faith made it possible for her to remain pure. And alongside of her brother's concern, she was able with their reinforcement to do the right thing. And, and for this, she's being honored. She's being honored for it instead of ridiculed. Now today, we have people who will ridicule you uh, if you don't go out and sleep around. They ridicule you for doing that. They even make movies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin and others to make fun of somebody saying, you're not sophisticated, you're so naive, you haven't really experienced what it means and, and to have sexual you know, uh, pleasure and all of that. And, and we make comedies about it. Or somebody gets a purity ring and, and, and a little girl gets it by her daddy. He takes her out on a date and he prays with her and he says, I'm giving you this ring here, baby. You wear it. That means that, that it's a symbol of your purity. And then her friends see that. What's that? Well, my dad gave me this ring. Your dad gave you a ring. What for? Well, it's a symbol of my purity. I'm going to retain my virginity. And, and they say, why? What's the big deal? And they mock you and they ridicule you. That is, the world doesn't stand up and say, oh, you made a great decision. You know that and I know that. When you stand up and say that, that chastity is a good thing, purity is a good thing. When you say abstaining is a way to keep me from getting an unwanted pregnancy and a venereal disease and even worse, people will say, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's ridiculous. If these Hollywood people really cared about, your, about, about AIDS and all, they wouldn't be promoting casual sex in all the movies that you see. They can wear their little ribbons all they want, but the movies they make are saying something entirely different. We know that. And so what you need to do is you need to make a decision, a decision that you are going to, one, have friends around you that encourage you to do the right thing, and two, that you're going to take care of your own business also because it's worth it, because it is something that actually get, gets you honor instead of ridicule. So she says that in verse 10, I'm a wall, my breasts like towers. She's saying, I resisted any efforts to violate my purity, and ultimately I met my husband. And it was worth it. Because, notice with me, when he found her, she brought him peace. As one, he said, she says, who found peace. There was nothing for that husband to have to deal with. No disappointment over her poor choices or anything like that. She was somebody that, as he got together with, that he could respect and he could love her because she had made those proper choices. Proverbs 31, 25 says, Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. And so as we're looking at that, we're seeing the Shulamite as she's speaking. But in verse 11, it says, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver, so it begins to speak concerning the fact that Solomon was a landowner. He leased out vineyards. And her brothers and were some who had leased the vineyard from him. They were working this property. They gave him rent money for its use. And it was the field the Shulamite used to work in before she got married to Solomon. But as she says that, in verse 12 it says, My own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand. And those who keep its fruit... 200. I want to speak to you about this. I'm going to spend a few moments sharing with you about what she's talking about here. Used to lease out a vineyard, but now I have one of my own. And now you get into the picture of what the vineyard is. The vineyard is, is her love. It's herself. She sees herself as Solomon's vineyard. And she's saying to him, you have the right to the fruit of your vineyard. So she withholds nothing that belongs to him and gives him the rewards of love completely, without reservation. Now, notice you, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who keep its fruit two thousand, or rather two hundred. You may have a thousand, those who keep its fruit two hundred. Solomon, I've got love that I give to others, but I give you the most. I give you five times as much love as I give to anybody else. Do you want to have a relationship that endures? Do you want to have a marriage that has an, a lasting love? Learn from the Shulamite woman. When you get married, your husband or your wife is to become your greatest love. Your spouse should never compete with anyone for your love or your attention. Your father and your mother do not come between your love for your mate. 
There needs to be this sense that you are loved completely. Does it happen immediately? Well, when people get engaged, they have this kind of goofy belief that, you know, you know everything's going to be perfect from this day on. And, and, and that's understandable. I, I used to do uh, premarital counseling in the early days of our ministry here. And, and, and I would sit with the, uh, with the bride and the victim. And as we would sit together, I would say, I would say, all right, everybody in their relationship, uh, when you begin to get to know one another, you will find something about that person that, that causes you a little bit of irritation. And so you can have in your mind a desire to bring some changes. And they're both just, you know, sitting there. And so I'd look at the, at the husband and I would say to the husband-to-be and I'd say, um, surely you've discovered some things about your fiance that you would like to change. Uh, what would they be? And he would look at me with this goofy look. It always happened. Oh, nothing. Nothing, nothing. She's, I said, you're telling me she's perfect. As far as I'm concerned, she is. And she'd just be sitting there smiling at me. <laughs> All right. Then I'd look at her. This is the truth. I'm not making this up. I'd look at her and I'd say, now, surely there are things about him that you think need to change. Man, they pull out a list from their purse, man. <laughs> Where do you want me to begin? A to Z or numbers? It doesn't matter, you know. Points and subpoints. I mean, she always had something in her mind that he was no longer going to do once they got married. He walked in like the ox ready for slaughter. And she walked in with a list, and it happened every time. You have to prod a little bit. You have to kind of poke a bit. But they, they, oh, yeah, well, you know, I don't like this. Well, they're going to, you know, and that's what happens. you got to really know that. And so when you're dating... You may think, oh, I've got all this love for this person and, and I will always love them and there'll never be anything that creates any conflict. And, and, and that may be so during your dating relationship. It may be so. You may be dating somebody who's keeping it all under wraps until you sign that license. And then, ah, Dr. Jekyll <laughs> and Mr. Hyde, you're mine now. I'm telling you. You usually find that out during the honeymoon. And you know what happens? You have to work. Iron sharpens iron. And you have to work. You have made your commitment before God and man to live together, and that's what you begin to do. You may think that the day you got married was the day that you loved that person the most, and that's just not the truth. True love grows every day. Another old song, I love you more today than yesterday. Well, that's true. True love is something that actually grows over time. Every day is a new dimension. Every day there's a stronger love. Every day there's more commitment. It just happens that way if you're really pursuing love the way it ought to be pursued. You just grow in love. You love them when you first got married. You love them 10 years later. You love them 20 years later. You love them 30 years later. You love them more today than you did yesterday. That's how it worked. And, and, it, and it's something that you work on. It's not something that's automatic, but it is something that you work on. And, and eventually what happens is, is you discover that in the eyes of this person you're married to, you have become the most important person in their life. So the question, obviously, I would ask of all married couples here is, are you the most important person in their life? If they were to have an honest question asked of them, is your husband the most important person in your life? Is he your hero? What would you honestly say? If, if someone pointed to your wife and said, is she the most important person? Do you give her five times what you give everybody else? The Shulamite says, uh, you may have a thousand, those who keep its fruit, 200. Are you, are, is she, does she know that? Does she know how, how deeply you love her? Or are we still playing like we're 12 years old? We'll love you just a little bit so that you'll love me more than I love you, so I can control you with my love, because the one who loves most has least power in a relationship. The one who loves less has most power in a relationship. And a lot of us learn that in an early portion of our lives. I'll just give them enough to keep them coming, 
just keep them after me, but I'll hold back with them so that they're always hungry for a little bit more. That's in a lot of marriages today, where men and women are unwilling to, unable for whatever reason, to just say, I'm giving you everything I have. A few years ago, I've shared this before, but a few years ago, I was in Florida doing some ministry. We had gotten up very early and we had flown, flew out of Los Angeles, I think around six in the morning. And we had ministered the night before. I was very tired. And on the plane, I began to feel something called an aura. I began to know that, that I was gonna have an episode of, have, of temporary amnesia, which I'd had in the past. I was looking at my Bible, trying to read it, and the words were swimming on the page, and I didn't tell my wife anything, but I knew, uh-oh, I'm gonna have a, an episode. And, and, and I began to pray. I do remember praying and saying, God, please, not while I'm teaching. Please, not while I'm teaching. And I was expecting it. And we got to Miami and went to our hotel room, and because of the three-hour time differential, I had time to take a, a very brief shower, get dressed, and go to church. When I got there, I, I, I happened to like Cuban coffee. And so I told my wife, honey, can you give me a cup of coffee? And she came and brought two double shots of Cuban espresso. Those of you who know Cuban coffee, it's pretty strong. She gave me four shots of espresso. Yeah, I saw God. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I downed them, you know, boom. I went out to teach that, that night, and about three quarters into the message, I repeated myself. And I didn't realize what was happening, but I'd had this before. And what was happening is my memory was fading. I was going into amnesia. I finished the study, but Marie was alert. She knew what happened. She knew what her husband had done. She knew something was going on. She'd seen it before. I remember stepping down from the platform. I had given an invitation. People came forward. I went down. I spoke to people. Marie came walking up, and she was near me, and I took her, and I said, you need to get me out of here. I don't know where I'm at. She was the only person I knew, so she took me by the arm and led me into another room. There were paramedics who were present at the particular Bible study I was doing, and so they rushed into the back, and they did some blood pressure and this and that, and they said, yeah, this man's going to have a stroke. We've got to get him into the hospital immediately. And they took me in an ambulance. I don't remember much about it other than the noise and the rush and the bright lights and things like that. Got me to the hospital. I do remember some basic tests. Don't really remember much about that was placed in a bed. About three or four in the morning, I, I woke up, and I looked to the side. There's a cot next to the bed, and there's my wife laying next to me, just laying there. She wouldn't leave my side. Three days, four days, she stayed there. She'd only go and shower and come back, shower and come back, and she stayed next to me, right? So I remained in uh, Miami for two or three extra days, stayed at a friend's place, came home and went to the doctor, started going to a neurologist. He took what is called a PET scan. He said, we're concerned because it seems that there's calcification on your left and right frontal lobe and concerned about that. Sent me to a neurologist, a, uh, a neuro, neuro, neurological psycho, psychologist who gave me like, a battery of 10 tests. And, and I'm going through all of these tests and so at the end of the test, she scores them, and, and I'm seated across from her, Marie's next to me, and so she says, well, she goes, eight of these tests, you came out fine. Two of them have cause of concern. And I said, listen, I'm the kind of person who doesn't respond unless you really put a fire under me. You need to tell me what is going on. And she began to say, it looks like you have symptoms of dementia. Well. I always knew I was demented. Dementia is something else. <laughs> and so I, uh, I said, and exactly what does that mean? And she began to explain it. And I said, so this is something that could be progressively worse until it's permanent amnesia? She said, yes. 
How long do I have? Have you been there before? Were you sitting in front of a doctor and your life is gone? Have you been there? Where you look in the eyes of somebody who's holding your life in their hand at that moment and you're asking for help and you're asking them, how long have you been there? It's a hard place to be. Seven years. I have seven years. If you take care of yourself, you have seven years. So I say, okay. And I turn to my beloved and I say to her, I'm going outside going into the car. Take care of this for me. Okay. Marie walks in after taking care of it, opens the door, sits next to me. A bomb has just exploded in our life. And I turn to her as I'm holding the steering wheel, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, right? What are we going to do? Seven years. And I'm going to not know you seven years. And I won't know my grandchildren. My life is my ministry. My memory is my toolbox. Lord, are you taking my tools from me? What are you going to do? So we talked to my kids. I waited a while, never told the church. Most of you, if you've been with me for a while, you didn't really hear what was going on. I just came and did what God called me to do, which is to teach his word and trust him. And so we finally, because the kids are concerned, I call them kids, they're all adults. Had them in my office, sat them down. Marie begins to explain the situation, kind of candy coating it as my girl does. And I, being who I am, said, that's enough. Let me tell them what's really going on. I have seven years. I will lose my memory. Take care of your mom. Let me. I'm preparing for her. That's what my life is. It's for her. You don't have to clap. It gets worse. Actually, it doesn't. It gets better. Take care of your mama. This is what you're going to do. This is how it's going to be. Your mama won't allow this, but I'm telling you in front of her, this is what you're going to do for her. So I tell Marie, let's just prepare and just enjoy what we've got. Well, I have to go back to the doctor. The neurologist, I didn't go. I said to her, why would I go and hear more bad news? So we had a church trip going to Hawaii, and I said, we're just going to Hawaii. I'm going to enjoy going to Hawaii. That's before I found out I had skin cancer. <laughs> and so we go to Hawaii. I come back, and Marie and I go, and we sit down with the doctor, the neurologist, and he says, after making us wait for about an hour, you know, Sometimes we make mistakes. There's nothing wrong with you. You're okay. And I say, I'm going to kill you. No, I, <laughs> I'm okay. But in the midst of all, and I want to repeat that because I mentioned this on second service and I had people walking up saying, Pastor, are you okay? Yeah, I forgot to tell you. I'm okay. I'm okay. I, they, would, they misdiagnosed me. But see, here's the point of what I was trying to say is when I was talking to my kids, I said this to them. And I've said this once openly before this congregation. You may have heard me say this, but I said to my children, I am the greatest man your mother has ever known. And when I said that, my children, my own children looked at me like, Daddy, how arrogant. And so I smiled at him and I said, no, I am the greatest man your mother has ever known. And I turned to my wife, Marie, and I said, baby, who's the greatest man in your life? And she looked at me. She said, you are. She said, your father is the greatest man I have ever known. There's a point to that story. 
husband, become the greatest man your wife will ever know. Make that your aim. There can be no hero outside of you. There can be no man that she respects greater than you. You are that man God has called you to be and make it your chief aim because one of these days she's gonna put you in a box and your voice is gonna be in her head and she's gonna remember what you told her. And I made it a name to make sure she heard the words, I love you forever and ever and I will never stop loving you. You will become a man in her sight when you yield yourself. She said, I give 200 to others, but I give a 1,000 to you. That's what you want. Forgive the emotion, but that's what you want in your life. That's what you want. That's what makes love endure. She knew this man and she loved him. Yes, love your daddy, love your mama. But listen, sometimes when you get married, and dad may have been that one you came to, little girl, and you'd come to daddy and ask for advice. Well, when my Anna recently was married, and I did this before with my, my others who were married, I've done the same kind of thing, but recently with Anna, I spoke to her husband-to-be, and I've spoken to her. And I've said, I stay out of your business. I may be your daddy, but he's your husband. And you need to respect him. And you need to listen to him. And you need to, to be his bride and go to him and ask for advice and direction. That's what husbands do. See, for me, I'm your pastor. If you need spiritual direction, I will give it only upon request. And I told Gabe, my, my son-in-law, recently before they married, I said, Gabe, I will never step between you and your wife. You have the responsibility to be the man in the home. You have the responsibility to seek the Lord. And so I'm not one who intrudes. I will not step in. Yeah, I'm the pastor, and yeah, I've got experience, and yes, I can help, and I do, and I do know my daughter. I can do, I have all of that. But she's supposed to go to you. She's supposed to speak to her husband, and together you have to work out your own business. If you ever get to the point where you need a pastoral advice or direction, I'm more than willing to give as much as you're willing to accept. But I'm not the first one. The first one is the Lord, and then together you work that out. That's how it works. You see, sometimes people will just say, well, I'll just go ask dad or I'll go ask mom. Some women never stop asking dad, and some, da some husbands are always comparing their wives to their moms. You know, oh, bad idea, but they do. You know, my mom's beans are better than these, the way that you ought to talk. Oh, that, oh ooh, those are war words. You don't want to do that. Mm -mm. Honey, this is the best I've ever eaten in my whole life. These are the very best. What is it? But it's really good. You know, I found it dead on the highway and just thought I'd give it a shot and see what it tastes like. Oh, baby, it's a good roadkill. It's very good. You have to be careful what you lay down in your relationship. You have to be careful. This man knew, and this is a key, that he was loved. Love heals. Love heals. And when that man knows that there is nobody else, it heals. It heals in the proper way. And when that woman knows that, that this man loves her more than anybody else and there's nobody that could come between her and him it strengthens you and so she's simply saying I have given you the greatest portion of my vineyard that produces a love that lasts now finally verses 13 and 14 you who dwell in the gardens the companions listen for your voice let me hear it now the Shulamite responds, Make haste, my beloved. Be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So when he's speaking, dwelling in the gardens of her love is another way of saying, I'm at peace with you in your quietness and your peacefulness. So I want to be with you because this is what you bring into my life. But she, 
is finding contentment in being simply with him. And so she concludes this with an invitation. And she's simply saying, come and enjoy yourself with me. She's saying, hurry home. I miss you. I'm waiting for you. Home should be the place we long to be more than anywhere else. Home. Home is more than a house. A house is a dwelling place. A home is filled with a family and love. I didn't want a house. I own a house, but I live in a home. A home is filled with love and peace. It's filled with the presence of God. It's filled with my family, but it is especially filled with the presence of the one person in my life, outside of my Jesus, that I love with every beat of my heart. It's filled with my wife. She's made it a home. And for the Shulamite to close this by saying, make haste and come home. Well, that's an invitation because home should be the place that we long to be. And we shouldn't desire to be anywhere else. Father, would you work in us your will that we might have the awareness that we actually put into our marriages what we receive from them. And some of us, Lord, in our marriages are not doing well. There are some who are failing even at this moment. Some are brokenhearted because they don't have what they wanted. And it may be even so far from them now that there's very little hope. Others are doing well in their marriages and there's everything in between. I just lift up our relationships. I lift up our our families, I lift up our marriage situations, our singleness or our married estate. And I just pray that as we've gone through this particular book that you've helped us to lay some solid foundations that we might be able to, to build on. And may that foundation really be the word of God, Jesus himself, who keeps us together. And may we grow in this, Lord, and not take it for granted. Work in us, I pray. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, there are some right now perhaps who need some prayer. And you might have a variety of reasons why you need prayer, but you do. And you need, you need perhaps to get right with the Lord or there's something going on, whatever the case may be. I, I, I want to pray for you. If you have a need, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right now? Just raise your hand. Father, I, I lift up these who are raising their hand to you. You know exactly what's going on inside. You know whatever situation they find themselves in and you know whatever pressure or pain they may be experiencing. I'm asking that you would reach down right now and you would touch them. That they might have peace in you, Lord, that they might be able to cast this care on you with the knowledge that you really care for them. And if there's an area in their life, Lord, that you're speaking to at this moment, may they yield that to you and may you, may you heal and may you, you make them whole and, and, and may they move on and, and may they grow in you, Lord. May they be determined to pursue you. So I'm asking that your hand might be upon them now as their hands are raised. And I pray that you would move in them and that you would work through them. We receive from you now and thank you, Lord. Bless you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, would you just keep moving in all of us now? We're about to leave. We pray that you would go with us. In your name we pray. Amen. I pray the study was encouraging. And I want to thank you for your continued support and prayers and invite you to join us next Sunday night as we move into the next part of our study. As I mentioned earlier, if you would like to give your offering, you can do so online. If you're using a computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the Menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under Four Ways to Give to process your gift. And finally, you can either mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710. Or, if you're able, you can come to the sanctuary and use the kiosk we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts. You can also place your gift in an envelope handed to one of the receptionists in the foyer. So thank you. God be with you. And we look forward to having you with us once again.